like you start reading her book and then at one point in time it is just a flip you know and then there is a very different kind of argument that you are not expecting in that uh, piece that the way it evolves so it's very exciting work that uh, uh, that she has developed over time uh, uh, to her credits there are three books and uh, they are really fascinating one of the most latest is the public health and private wealth a uh, stem cell surrogates and other strategic bodies it's been co-edited with dr mohan rao who used to be with jnu and now he's uh, he's kind of you know uh, is in bangalore and he's retired now and it presents uh, very novel approach approaches to politics of health in modern india it's an edited volume and there's a uh, the chapters really are very multidisciplinary from across the uh, studies Uh, the second book that uh, it's another exciting book is the contraception colonialism and commerce and which talks about the birth control history between the period of 1920s and 40s and i think what i like about um, that book is it talks about the advocacy efforts that uh, that were shaped up around the contraception in indian context and how it goes you know the her whole book talks about and she argues that it's not only about advocacy or about the contraception use but how also it facilitated and the stakes uh, were claimed around the you know uh, for women and uh, about their ability to uh, ability and you know ability to exercise their rights and self uh, rule etc uh, and i would like to mention a couple of other papers which so and it is a very very interesting paper and she uh, this is from ijb Uh, there are a couple of other uh, works that I I feel really um, kind of excited about. One is that she's worked on the garbage, medical garbage in in Chennai, and once again her uh, argument is, um, which is generally we are familiar with, that you know it led to the modification of uh, waste management. It's not a <coughs> product of neoliberalism, but all those little stories actually give a meaning to what neoliberalism is. Yeah, you know so i think there's there's always has been a philip in that uh, the way she has developed her uh, scholarship uh, today's talk is about her uh, current work and it's a uh, uh, she is uh, she is a grant recipient and the grant is from the welcome trust uh, uh, it's a collaborative uh, grant and it's for the five years and probably you might some of you might be interested to talk to her after the talk Uh, but i am going to leave this to matthew to introduce the topic of the talk today and i would may i invite uh, sara and matthew to take the dais and then hand over the reins to uh, dr matthew thank you Yeah, I thought since I don't have slides, I'll be more interactive, you know, because you, I'll have to keep you away from where we are. So I have to walk around so and see talks. Yeah, probably both of you can pull a chair sure. and sit here. No, in fact, I can just talk to somebody somewhere. of larger international interest and the kind of 
poverty in which our country is in. So the facility level concerns that we face in the context of access is a serious issue. And today I think we are moving on to the issue largely from a quality point of view. And quality within that, there are several categorization of spurious drugs, fake drugs, and I think I recently I told that we don't have a law that regulates fake drugs. It's largely the categorization of spurious that we talk about. So what are the forms of spurious drugs that exist and how that entire dynamics, because most of the time quality is looked at as a health system concern, as if that the yeah, systemic factors matter. Yes, it matters. But is it just that? Or what about the larger pharmaceutical context in which it creates a kind of commodification of drugs which translates and influences the quality when it comes to the patient. So that is what the kind of larger talk that I think we are today on. So looking at one, what are the forms of spurious that exist in categories? And on the other hand, how does the larger neoliberal forces and the pharmaceutical industry as a commodity plays an important role in deciding the very quality of drugs? So with that, I leave it to the speaker. Thank you so Dr. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so if I speak like this, you can all hear? So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for the organizing and for the big poster outside the main gate. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come to Mumbai. I actually haven't been here so often, but more recently. Uh, and the main thing is I have feel I've learned so much from interacting with people's health movement, academics working in India, because there's a way in which one can talk about the politics of health here that in UK or US actually you don't get the same sense of both scholarly rigor and political urgency. And so I think it's the combination of those two things that I've always found absolutely compelling. And uh, so thanks for giving me the opportunity to be here. Now I want to give you first a little bit of background about uh, this thing. I got such a lovely introduction. But effectively, my work is on the politics of health. And I think you could say, although I am a historian, card-carrying, and all that, I am a bit of a laxed historian. It means uh, I work in the very contemporary past, particularly for the last 10 years, really from the 80s up till now. So and I was uh, very inspired and like struck one time, maybe seven, eight years ago, I was at a meeting that had been organized by, I think actually it was Ahmed, uh, on universal health care, universal health coverage. And at that time, Imran Akadar hadn't retired, and she got up and she said, if you know her, you'll know her. <laughs> why health now? Right? And I'm really struck because it's both a political question and a historical question. What is it at our current historical moment that makes forms of welfareism by the state appear appealing to the state. Because as Amrana went on to say, it's not as though they care. So this has, in one way or the other, I think I've been thinking about this historical conundrum for uh, ever since then. So thank you, Amrana. And, um, and she always does it so stylish. You know? I can in many ways. So, uh, and very briefly, so that's the bigger question, and in a sense, the projects that I've been working on have been historical, insofar as we can think about the 20th century, the politics of health over the course of the 20th century in India, how does it start out? It starts out by the most pressing problem for any government, political, in, uh, sorry, uh, colonial, independent, whatnot, as the eradication of poverty. This is the most pressing question for a legitimate government. But by the end of the 20th century, what do we have? In a sense, poverty, legitimate governance is still there as an equation, but it's flipped into the promotion of economic growth as a solution to the problem of poverty. The poor itself, as we all know, bodies of the poor effectively become a resource for the state in the, this thing of economic growth. So that gives you a sense of you know, where I'm coming from in terms of uh, approach. And this particular project, and for those of you who are students, here's a great tip. So we're always doing research, right? Collecting data, whatever. And when we're doing research, often the research itself gets a little and the things one sees going around are actually really exciting. So this is the prod, uh, product of when I was living in Chennai doing this garbage work, running around going, running around in the dump, literally, uh, 
wear strong chuckles this morning. Uh, behind hospitals, in the compound, and this scandal came up in the news. And I didn't know what to think of it, but I thought there's nothing to be said about this. So I just kept, well, at that time, and because I'm a historian, actually, I had an actual filing cabinet. So I really kept it in the filing cabinet. And uh, then the time came to think about it. So that's the seed of this one. And it turned into a bigger project that I'd be happy to talk about. But I think the question is, in a sense that uh, motivates, or that I'm most curious about, is we know about, thanks to friends from Lawyers Collective, Kajal Bhadwaj, Gopal Kumar Ahmed, Sen Gupta, their really tireless work thinking about the international political economy of health via pharmaceuticals. So we know the story of Indian generics, etc., etc. Big pharma, blocking access. I think what we are less familiar with, or at least what I have been less familiar with, is to what degree these relationships are repeated in the context of the domestic market itself. So that's the starting point for this one. And as I said, about 40 minutes, I'm just going to read, but it's a good story. But if anybody feels they have to have a little nap, you know, it's that time. Especially if you've had a Okay, so um, the starting point is really when we talk about the problem of fake drugs. It seems commonsensical. We all know what is the problem of fake drugs. Fake drugs are fake drugs. That's a problem. And what I would like to invite you to consider is the proposition that actually when people are talking about fake drugs, they're almost always talking about something else. And it's that something else that I'm particularly interested in exploring in this talk. So, the case of the spirit. And as you know, uh, one Chennai Kara is here. Yeah, Ningen yet? Oh, Ara! Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Chennai, maybe you're more familiar with Mumbai, you think, oh yeah, Bombay is the capital of healthcare. Well, I would encourage you to think again. Because in Chennai, People are very busy in the healthcare economy, left, right, and center. And that's where this story takes place. In March 2010, a story broke in the paper that a three-year-old girl had died after taking antibiotics her parents had bought for her uh, and given to treat her fever. The city's media picked up and ran with the story the scandal gripped the city for weeks. Newspaper headlines and radio and television news outlet broadcast the bad news every day for weeks and weeks. Spurious drugs had found their way into Chennai's pharmacies. In response, the police got onto a war footing. They carried out raids of homes and offices. Evidence mounted. And any early attention paid to the death of a little girl quickly was overshadowed by updates on the search for the culprits. The police uh, uh, quickly were able to seize and display four lakh rupee of suspect drugs. And you would have all seen these kinds of uh, photographs in the newspaper. You know, the police are there in uniform, the loot is laid out, justice is being served. Is this the story? Before long, Newspapers reported that clinical masterminds sought were, however, neither retail pharmacists nor the manufacturers. Instead, the police pointed to a network of distributors. By the end of May 2010, the police had 12 people working as distributors in custody. They were charged with forgery and cheating offenses. And this included the man who was to become the chief accused dubbed the Spurious Drugs Kingpin. Distributors, along with stockists, but particularly distributors, are a largely invisible linchpin that connects us to our drugs. They move drugs from where they are manufactured to retail outlets where they can be bought. And in this case, newspapers allege that the culprits, having properly collected expired or nearly expired drugs from retailers, deviated from the law. As the story unfolded, readers were given a picture of a sophisticated racket that precisely exploited the strict regulations that exist to protect consumers from purchasing expired drugs. And so here's a little bit of a technical interlude, and I apologize if you already know this. 
Under the terms of India's Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 2008, pharmaceutical retailers are incentivized to keep a close eye on expiry dates printed on the packaging of the products they stock. No one wants to be sold expired drugs. All retailers are required to keep a box labeled not for sale in which they store about to expire products to guarantee that retailers incur no loss for unsold expired stock. The law mandates that manufacturers must arrange for the regular collection and disposal of these items. So it seems sensible. So just as distributors bring drugs for the manufacturer to the retailer, who of course sell it out to us, they also tread the circuit in reverse, collecting unsold drugs from retailers. However, in this case, rather than disposing of these drugs as required, it was alleged that distributors relabeled the drugs with false expiry dates. The police alleged that they then redistributed them, illegally imprinted, of course, with longer shelf lives. So, at the time the story broke, the urgency in the reporting turned on the immediate dangers that these allegedly expired redistributed drugs presented to the consuming public. However, a closer investigation of this episode suggests a more complicated picture. Uh, officials at the United States Drug Control Agency were quick to reassure members of the public that, despite the tenor of the news coverage, none of the drugs identified had actually reached pharmacies or been sold to consumers. Indeed, even Karananadi, then still the state's chief minister, thought sought to calm his restive legislative assembly by reminding the elected members of the distinction between expired drugs and poison. And the newspaper headline was great. Expired drugs are safer. Karanani said, what's a little expired drugs between friends? As only he could have, really. So people were being reassured by state agencies. No one believed any of this. And one state, MLA, uh, suggested that the sellers of the drugs in question should be punished by the same laws that were used for the crime of murder for gain. In this feverish environment, one seemingly vital element in the story, however, remained significantly underreported. While the distributors' alleged actions were certainly illegal, there was never any direct evidence put on display to show that these redistributed drugs, or soon to be redistributed drugs, were in fact dangerous. <coughs> Revisiting this scandal thus presents a puzzle. If the public was not necessarily in danger, then what exactly was all the human cry about? So, the suspects. Back to the story. Over the course of the media coverage in uh, April and May 2010, individual characters emerged, along with the tales of the scam. One such suspect was Venkatesan. Venkatesan was the van driver. Having been named by the police as a, somewhat, a sought-after person, he soon surrendered. And de he was the bird that sang, detailed all the practices and official statements to the authorities. These, in turn, fueled media reports. Readers learned that it was Venkatesan who did the distributor's work of collecting the expired or nearly expired contents of the pharmacist's not-for-sale boxes, but instead of disposing them at the city dump, as was required by law, Venkatesan delivered them to a godown. Venkatesan, the van driver, it transpired, was from Korangayur. And for those of you familiar with Chennai, this is in the far north of the city where the biggest city dump is. So he was nearby where he was supposed to be putting the drugs. It houses the city's largest and oldest municipal dump. Uh, and within Kodangayor, Venkatesan was from Erlilnagar, which is a neighborhood of tight streets laid out in a uh, strict, uh, this thing, grid. Uh, and a mainly residential area abutting the vast dump. That's where if you live on certain streets, you can just walk into the dump and do a bit of picking to supplement your income and come out again, which is not uncommon. Many houses in Yerunagar are repurposed as small workshops, shops, uh, and these include many businesses where workers, scrap workers, sit alongside, and pickers, sit alongside open gunny sacks full of recovered scrap, sorting the materials into different categories, which I had got to know from my garbage project, and very familiar with that place. And these objects in turn sell the, fuel the area's many small manufacturing businesses 
that turn the city's discards into sellable items. So small vans like the one that Venkatesan was driving in and out of Yerunagar uh, uh, are regularly moving around. And in a sense, Venkatesan was one among many recyclers. There was also Ravi. Ravi was also from Yerunagar. And whereas Venkatesan ex collected the expired trucks, it was Ravi to whom Venkatesan delivered them. Ravi then transported the drugs from Yerunagar to Koyambate. Now again, if you're not familiar with Chennai, Koyambate is on the western fringe of the city, although the city has grown a bit more since then. It's home to both the city's largest fruit and vegetable market, as well as the city's long-distance bus terminus. Koyambate is a dense transfer point for goods and people, and it is where this alleged drugs relabeling operation was located. In Coimbed, newspapers reported there was a residential compound where workers repurposed the drugs using chemicals to remove the manufacturer's expiry and batch dates printed on foil, and then reprinting the packets with uh, fresh dates. The drugs would then be redistributed to new retailers, although it was never clear uh, the degree to which this redistribution was happening, or indeed if the fresh buyers of the stale drugs knew what they were getting or not. Anyway, leave that. According to Venkatesan's statements to the police, not only did the entire relabeling operation take place at the business premises of a legitimate licensed distributor for the drugs called Mina Medical Agencies, uh, it was uh, owned by Meenakshi Sundaram and apparently masterminded by him too. So, our third character now, Meenakshi Sundaram. The importance of Meenakshi Sundaram, spurious drugs came in. The burden of scandal fell unevenly. Meenakshi Sundaram owned and operated the drugs distribution company that emerged at the center of the scandal, and Meenakshi Sundaram had gone on the run. In the following week's media coverage, it emerged that the police had seized one crore worth of drugs from the King Thin storage facilities. The number kept getting bigger and bigger. For the police, Meenakshi Sundaram was already a well-known person. This 2010 episode was the third time in as many years he'd been sought in relation to distributing spurious drugs throughout Kamala. And Minakshi Sundaram had swagger. Newspapers wrote lyrically about his life as a man about town, and I quote, From riding a moped to driving a Ford Endeavor SUV, Minakshi Sundaram, whose present worth is estimated to be over 100 crore, has come a long way. He's, he owns three cars and has struck deals with other businessmen in the Cosmopolitan Club on Amasale, where he was known to spend his evenings in the company of affluent and elite friends. Sundaram was conscious of his looks and made an extra effort to groom himself. He was dressed immaculately and lived in style. In his two flats, the police said, huge frame photographs of himself adorn the walls and have a wide collection of luxurious goods. And the final nail in his coffin, his children go to any schools. Right, so if you watch Narcos, you know, like this is a, and a great, uh, there's a wonderful, if slightly saucy, spicy word for this in Tamil is minor. He's like, uh, huh? Maybe, anyway, he has to be, poor guy. Uh, so you get the idea. Meenakshi Sundram also had financing. The Hindu newspaper reported that he operated eight bank accounts. And Meenakshi Sundram was the object of outrage. Newspapers reported when he was finally arrested and taken uh, to face the court. Uh, quote, when they were brought, when he and a number of people were brought to the Egmore Court on Wednesday, there was a tense situation for about half an hour. As the policeman according Meenakshi Sundram to the court played safe, and refrain from using force to keep the lawyers at bay, the accused ended up receiving punches and blows to the face and the head as the lawyers there declared in unison that none among them would represent the accused in court. Despite that fracas, the newspapers reported, Meenakshi Sundram had connections. His repeated record of misbehavior, apparently without any accountability whatsoever, was, so it was said, due to his substantial financial connections to a major politician in the state. So, that's the kingpin. 
So let's step back a little bit and think about the story, how the story is working, what the story is pointing us to, and maybe also what it's distracting us from. Now, most police reporting, uh, most media reporting on policing, rather, is structured like a traditional crime mystery or whodunit. Police announcements on ongoing cases typically take place at very specific points. At the discovery of a crime and the opening of a case, upon bringing charges, at the commencement of a trial. In principle, the identity of the mastermind is only revealed upon the completion of a court case. Yet, the case of the Spheres Drugs Kingpin was no good on it. Readers, we did not have to yearn to learn the identity of the Kingpin. We were told at the outset. Instead, we were pulled into the story by a daily drip of detail. Now, whom did this drip feed of normally confidential detail serve? While well, Meenakshi Sundaram's personal habits and business practices were splashed across the media, as the examples I've given you show, uh, there was next to zero detail about the actual dangers to the public that the expired drugs may or may not have presented. Such a state of affairs suggests that it was neither pharmacological safety nor the health of the public that was at the heart of this case. Instead, Chennai's spurious drugs served as the ground on which other matters were contested. So, other matters. Let's take a look and see what these other matters were. Just as it seemed that the kingpin had secured his leading anti-hero role in the tale, there was a twist. What of the state agencies tasked with enforcing the existing regulations designed to keep drugs safe? Unsettling questions begin to surface when we ask these questions. Recall how the kingpin, a distributor, had been identified by manufacturers in successive years up until 2010. Uh, here's what seems to have happened. So manufacturers keep a close eye, as you can imagine, on their bottom line. They know each and every district how different drug sales are performing, and if there's a dip, they do not think it has to do with somehow people decided not to take Crocin that month, or some such thing, right? They know some things up with the distributor. Uh, so, uh, this is exactly what happened, and uh, in February 2010, this was around Reno, uh, sort of energy tablets. Uh, the manufacturer sought the attention of the drug control authorities and asked them please to enforce their own regulations. As it was reported in great detail, Rumors are already afloat that a pharmaceutical company and the Thumbnail Health Department, Thumbnail Health Department, got wind of this racket about a year before the complaint was filed with the city police. According to a police source, the health department had called the health department, having learned this, having been alerted, called a meeting of drug stockists and their distributors, which even the alleged kingpin attended at the DMS and tried to mediate. While the health secretary denied that there was such a meeting, the police officer who was also there gave the lowdown of all that transpired behind closed doors. He said it all started when the manufacturers uh, found the sales of the product had gone down. They connected the dots and it pointed to this fellow. As the media coverage of the scam continued, it came to light that the pharmaceutical manufacturers keep a close tabs on their figures. Uh, and that this is a standard practice, and actually since working with a colleague in uh, South Africa, this is actually standard practice everywhere, that both one keeps very close tabs on what's happening with one's sales figures, and one works very hard not to have any scandal come to light because of the possible reputational damage. Uh, so in the Chennai case, it seems that the manufacturer's attempts to move the state agencies to act were ineffective, the meeting with the health minister did not achieve the results desired, and it is difficult not to speculate that this dissatisfaction and this turn of uh, affairs led to a plan B in the form of a subsequent appeal, not to the health department, but to the Chennai uh, city police, who were, had an ongoing thing with the state anyway. Uh, if that was the case, it appears the city police robustly complied with the manufacturer's request uh, forming three special teams to arrest the culprits. Fighting the water. So there's a 
rivalry between the city and the state. There's a lack of transparency that the manufacturers themselves are requesting. And this rogue distributor is not complying with anything and happily driving his Ford SUV and dining out at the Cosmopolitan Club and putting big pictures of himself in the uh, house and sending his children to elite schools. Further muddying the waters, stories abounded in the media that Meenakshi Sundaram had flourished in the pharma trade thanks to the distribution trade, thanks to slush money provided by a family member of a senior state politician. As one way paper reported, the person who had provided uh, support to him had reportedly called on a senior member of the state cabinet and requested a transfer of the case to the CID. Even though the Chennai police had been doing well by arresting or forcing to surrender most of the key players. So it comes as no surprise then that the city police bridled when the Tamil Nadu state government moved to regain control of the case. The GGP, which is of course a state office, announced that given the cross-state nature of the alleged crimes, which was actually true, the manufacturer, pharma manufacturer was in Karnataka, mm, the case of Meenakshi Sundaram was to be transferred to the, from city police to CID. Uh, however, for their part, the city police claimed that it was an attempt to put a lid on the can of worms. And just recall here, that the reason you can transfer a case is you think there's going to be meddling locally. And what everyone was claiming is that the reason the case was transferred was a result of local meddling. So, what finally became of Meenakshi Sundra? He denied all charges against him. When he finally faced the court, he did not remain in prison long before he was granted bail. Of the five cases eventually filed against him that have received judgments, and they're the only ones you can actually look up, uh, no criminal charges stuck, although one completely unrelated tax matter was upheld. His business premises were ordered by the courts to be unsealed. His license to trade as a pharma distributor was restored. He was allowed to distribute the stock in his warehouses. Of the 12 other suspects who had been held, in connection with the scandal. It was only Meenakshi Sundaram Singh that can be found in the record at all, leading one to surmise that all charges against the others were also eventually dropped. Is this then the case of the serious drugs kingpin who got away? Meenakshi Sundaram's legal record also tells a tale. It suggests a man who fought not the administration of justice, but a man who fought unjust personal persecution. Although it was not granted, Meenakshi Sundaram's lawyer first filed anticipatory bail applications on his behalf. And as you know, anticipatory bail is a provision that allows someone to protect himself from being arrested when anticipating mischievous charges. Meenakshi Sundaram's lawyers also filed multiple petitions on his behalf, a form of legal address, as you know, that only the High Court can offer in the event that a, an individual's fundamental rights are or are about to be violated. That is to say, none of the evidence produced in any of the cases against the kingpin addressed any question of the relative public danger of his alleged crimes. Why not? Now, for the courts, the spurious drugs is about a crime of theft, not a crime of danger. Yet, in the newspaper coverage and public discussion, the condemnation and the jitters were not in relation to rights being abridged or fraud in manufacture, but the fear that gripped the city was about an imminent danger to public health. So how do we understand the distance between the outrage of the city concerned with life and death and its legal status that frames the accused as wrongly accused in merely a matter of business? So just to sort of sum up before moving on to some concluding remarks, spectacles are remarkable for the appearance they create. And in the case of the spurious drugs kingpin, the many newspaper photographs released of police standing over drugs laid out on tables and park walks produced a story of excess being reined in. In some, the public scandal that illuminated Meenakshi Sundaram as a culprit and a kingpin also illuminated the broader public health enforcement bureaucracy and its relationships with the pharma industry. Now, others, uh, which others, uh, mainly anthropologists and STS people have referred to as the performative world of drug security. But while that world was momentarily illuminated, 
It remained largely unexplored. The police acted in the name of public safety, but it's hard to see that they did anything but protect the interests of pharmaceutical manufacturers. They restored a status quo of the market. The case of the spurious drugs kingpin thus appears to have been more about mobilizing language of public safety in order to police the products, profits of pharma, and less about the quality of pharmaceuticals themselves. And I can't emphasize enough the paucity of data that connects this story to all discussion of drug quality across the world. There is no data. There is no data. There is no data. CDSCO did a study that's extremely unusual. They don't actually release the data. All data on drugs quality is done by manufacturers, and as such, it's seen as proprietary. <coughs> you and I want to go out and do some spot testing of markets. The price point at which laboratory analysis is pegged is an industry price point we can't afford. It's extraordinary that both in this story and with the international pharma market, it is, it's the, yeah, the, what is it? Who has the keys to the jail? It's the prisoners who have the keys to the jail. Completely. So it's not a surprise then that we have to get anxious about public health and public safety in the absence of any reliable information about this. Okay, so let's talk again briefly, sort of continuing to ask some questions about this course finishing. Who are the public in public safety? This tale of a spurious drugs kingpin, idiosyncratic policing, and ambiguous pharmaceutical quality was itself ultimately unresol unresolved in the course, and indeed the courts have no power to adjudicate as to questions of uh, pharmacological efficacy, potency, uh, existing stuff, they have the power to adjudicate who has the right to sell what. What it did clearly produce was a corollary story, however, of mounting public anxiety. As one newspaper reported over the past couple of weeks, enough has been going on in Chennai to get its residents little worried about whether they are getting genuine quality drugs when they are going to a pharmacy. The specter of an unsafe drug supply spooked many in the city and appeared to override the well, otherwise well-practiced social and economic divisions. The feeling of urgency in response to a perceived public health danger itself poses the question, who is collected in this collective? So the spirit, uh, story of spirit drugs was on my too, as I too was a Chennai resident in that uh, season, and read the city's newspapers that seemed to carry new revelations about the case on the front pages of most editions. I too was wondering what drugs I should buy my children so as not to kill them. During the early months of, uh, during the summer months of 2010, I spent a lot of time driving around the city, and one morning as I turned my car radio to, into one of the two or three FM stations that employed the trippy young men and women disc jockeys to play the latest hits from Kamal Cinema, the uh, radio DJ's atypically worried voice caught my ear. In Tamil, she asked many times over the course of her show, urging people to fun in, Okay, so basically she's saying, Chennai, it's wherever we go, whatever we do. We're all talking about this drug scandal. Is it true? Is it just a rumor? Who actually knows? We're all scared, what's your view? Such talk made a huge change from, the, from, as you know, the standard radio repartee. Until then, this DJ's most incisive observations had been confined to debating listeners over which of the Chennai Super Kings cricket celebrities would deserve the title of number one heartthrob. Uh, that's what these people talk about, not uh, uh, public health, uh, pharmacological quality. Somehow the every pra uh, everyday practices of local criminality, the existence of which we all know, is regularly acknowledged, but something that, as middle class people, we are rarely expected to experience directly, except maybe at the RTO. It had spilled over to threaten the affluent Chennai, whom the station targeted as its audience. 
we were a populace who regularly consumed, or at least aspired to consume, the best health that money can buy. Indeed, as we were saying, the city is home to Apollo's hospitals. Uh, India's first and in 2010, arguably still the most prestigious corporate hospital chain. We can't trust drugs anywhere anymore, even at Apollo? Came friends' worried questions to me since I was seen as the Apollo expert as we caught up over drinks. Our questions rehearsed the radio DJ spheres. Was no one safe when it came to Indian drugs? Although we were alarmed by this episode, it was very much a case where if indeed the drugs in question presented a clear and present danger to health. The victims were not going to be us, but in fact the city's wage laboring poor, and here's why. First, the question of which drugs were allegedly being relabeled bears some investigation. Recall the death of a three-year-old, purportedly due to antibiotics. Yet, antibiotics, although they are prescribed and consumed across gender social economic gamut, as any city would have, played no role in this case. Instead, the relabeled products, bar none, that this police, that the police seized were products like liver tonics for tiredness, painkillers, anti-rheumatics for achy joints, vitamins, mineral supplements, cough syrup. These are taken to ameliorate, as you know, the symptoms of being poor, so you can go to work the next day. The destitute, and it is the working poor who, are, who are buy these drugs, of course it is not the destitute who can afford them. And this is another great thing about Chennai, the like, alarming feature of Chennai's uh, healthcare economy. You talk to doctors, or actually healthcare administrators, and they say Chennai is the best market. And all of a sudden, the spin of Tamil Nadu as a kind of forward place comes in a ghastly way. They say, yeah, people are sick, but they don't die. People are poor, but they still have money. It's a recession-proof industry. So, and, so, and, so both the radio DJs and my friends were clear. We were all concerned about spurious drugs posing a threat to our personal safety, but how could, one, and how could one safeguard one's own health? We all asked if medicine itself was suspect. But I continued to wonder, what connected me and my well-heeled friends in the city's leafy southern suburbs to Kodamir, the site of the initial crime, a North Chennai neighborhood almost always preceded by the adjective notorious? A fake drug scandal could arguably prompt a trenchant review of enduring global inequalities. Yet, in the case of the spurious drugs kingpin, the poor constantly receded from view, as the middle classes appear to have misrecognized the dangers to the poor as dangers to ourselves. Why? This measure of anxiety struck me as much larger than seemed warranted. What might have accounted for this misrecognition? Perhaps we recognize our own spurious drug scandal as part and parcel of a different story, the story of global pharmaceutical counterfeiting. And this, and I'm really almost done now. So let's talk, so if we're talking about the public and public health, let's talk about the address of global health. Because this is really where we get that kind of narcos uh, super story to imagine these, you know, Meenakshi Sundaram driving around in his two tight trousers and looking at pictures of himself. Right, so what is the address of global health? At this point, it's useful to pull back the focus of our story and consider this question of our own misrecognition against a different scale of inquiry. Now, for some time, as I don't have to tell you, India's media horizon has been, and the world's media horizon, has been awash with alarming stories about fake drugs. Headlines include things like new counterfeiting reports highlight worrying trends. Fake industry operates openly. Most fake drugs pass every test. India becomes a hub for fake medicines. The fake industry is exploding, fake drug industry is exploding, and we can't do anything about it. Uh, Indians are at higher risk of getting fake. We've all read these time and again, and the wonderful statistic that's regularly cir uh, circulated in the global media that 75% of drugs circulating in India and uh, exported are fake. Right? So the Indian drugs industry is itself seen as a big wreck and posing dangers, particularly in these stories, to the poorest of the world's poor. So often the story is India has drugs in African markets. Uh, 
Uh, yet, most of these articles in the popular press fail to cite any research, even though, and having just done for this bigger project a review of all of the published research on the uh, drugs quality, they also fail to cite research. Indeed, the first thing that anybody in any of these drug stories write is, we were surprised that there was so little data, and it was inconclusive. Okay, so there's a major uh, 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 enthusiasm for ignorance, and global norm-setting institutions have fallen short of providing clear guidance. Over the past few decades, the world has witnessed an explosion of worry about fake drugs, but no corollary sets of research on them. Worries pour forth. All raise the collective alarm about the urgent and life-threatening dangers that these drugs present. During this time, there's any number of uh, technical terms. Spurious, that's an Indian speciality. Counterfeit, substandard, unregistered, illegal. The list goes on and on. There's no recognized definitions between them. Each had to do with a set of uh, regulatory definitions, but they're all always clubbed with falsified. And falsified means narcos, right? Is this criminal mastermind happening? Not that the cold chain is whatever. So the, uh, there's a lot of confusion. So anxieties about fake drugs produce a particular form of public health scandal and rehearse a set of particular, uh, spectacular forms. The perk walk, the drug bust, the worried chat. These accounts of Indian Pharma's first 21st century history are saturated with stories of the coterminous rise of the anti-counterfeiting movement. Together, they, su they suggest that to question the scourge that fake drugs present seems absurd, the doubt itself dangerous. Yet the case of the spurious drugs Kingpin and his alleged empire expiry, questions of where danger lie and where blame should fall are far from clear. It's precisely this problem, of course, for distributors when they become authors, that they become pirates. Uh, but it, and it, here it is the doubling of distributors into all uh, drugs that produce the scandal under consideration. But insofar as I said, uh, the scandal has a resolution, what seems to be put back into place is not a restoration of public health conditions, but the ability of manufacturers to control both the authorship of their product and the profit that uh, their profit their product produces. And again, what is completely absent is the matter of drug safety. Uh, now, alongside the popular circulation of international law, and I think it's impossible, and even in 2010, to read the story of the spurious drug Kingpin, independent from the uh, anti-counterfeit policing that's happening at the international level, uh, there is a longer history of suspicion, I think, that many uh, uh, in India hold regarding the veracity of consumer commodities and trickster figures. And indeed in the cultural studies literature, there's a very robust set of scholarship around this idea that post-colonial modernity is itself a copy. Hmm? Uh, so this, uh, at the same time, there's a more kind of moral uh, discourse on post-91 liberalization, where you get more and more things, but those things are not of good quality. Hmm? So this sense of when there's more and more health or more and more duplicate uh, phone chargers, you have to be more worried, right? That abundance is, in a sense, always suspect. And that's, in a sense, how cultural studies people, in a nutshell, argue about the blighted modernity of the post-colony. In the story of Spurious Drugs Kingpin, it's our misrecognition of our own danger, I think, is a function of merging the local landscape of drug circulation in Chennai with a broader, if more abstract, landscape of ambivalence with an otherwise urgent public health messages. Anxieties about drugs and the danger of global health emerge as a character in this Chennai story. It motivates the story. It's what we can read it through. Whereas, in a sense, uh, the, both middle-class journalists and our middle-class readers disregard questions of our own unlikely proximity to tainted cough syrup or energy tonics, uh, let alone going and buying uh, drugs from uh, pharmacies in notorious neighborhoods. But this ambiguity is itself productive, right? This, this worry about it. Uh, returning to the question posed by the story of the 
drug kingpin? What does it matter that we ventriloquize global health discourse about the nature of fake drugs? The ambiguous safety of expired or distributed drugs provides an opening for misrecognition, I would argue. This misrecognition is itself a resolution. For health matters as considered among affluent Chennaites in 2010, among whom I consider myself, this misrecognition of the spurious drugs kingpin as a player in the duplicitous global market in health precipitates a dreadful question. It's itself, itself impossible for drawing clear lines or achievable outcomes. In India, even if we are the rich, we can ask, are we the haves or are we still the have-nots when it comes to health? That's all. Thank you. And really, good job on um, staying with <laughs> Almost everybody. Okay, so. Thank you, Dr. Sada, for uh, illuminating the story of the uh, spurious drug in And it is interesting to see that most of the issues.